Right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you find yourselves in the world. Hello, my name is Sophia Arend, and I'm a senior analyst at the Global Blockchain Business Council. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Global Blockchain Business Council and Global Digital Finance's Global Leader Series. This is a weekly global town hall with policymakers and business leaders to hear their insights into their work, the state of blockchain technology and digital assets in current global affairs. Today, we have the pleasure to be joined by Michael Coletta, Head of Blockchain and Emerging Tech Innovation and Strategy at the London Stock Exchange Group, and our host, Sandra Rowe, GBBC CEO and GDF Board Director, for a conversation and live audience Q&A on building the next generation of market infrastructure for digital assets. Michael Coletta has been focused on blockchain technology in the financial market infrastructure space for over three years. In late 2017, he joined the London Stock Exchange Group's emerging technology team to lead the group's technology strategy for adopting blockchain across LSEG's capital markets in financial market infrastructure businesses. Michael also represents LSEG in the European Commission's expert group on regulatory hurdles to fintech innovation. In his previous role at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, he was involved in cryptocurrency futures and also worked on other blockchain related proof of concepts focused on post-trade settlement and collateral management. Thanks so much, Michael, for joining us today. We welcome your questions at any point during today's webinar and kindly ask that you submit them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Without further ado, I'd like to hand things off to our host, Sandra. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sophia. Really appreciate um, the introduction and also great to have a friend, former colleague and uh, current GBC member, uh, Michael Coletta with us today. He's going to share some of his insights and thoughts around uh, where we are, where we're heading. Uh, but before we kick off about what London Stock Exchange Group is doing, Michael, tell us a little bit about your journey into blockchain world. And you, you know, you're a technologist, you're a developer, um, you've got the technical skills, and you've actually transitioned over to the business side, which is not always an easy transition. Um, can you give us a you know, synopsis of sort of your journey. Yeah, uh, thanks Thanks for inviting me, Sandra, and thanks everyone. Um, yeah, so the journey, it's kind of funny, right? Because, um, you know, as a, I think, you know, there's there's two kinds of uh, like technology professionals or developers, um, and, and and both are perfectly uh, are valid. You know, one side is that, you know, you're in this kind of software engineering career, you're building stuff, you're seeing the immediate results of, of what you're actually doing, right? So you get to see the tangible results of your productivity. Um, you know, where you see the business side and it's more abstract, you know, you're building PowerPoints and, you know, a lot of people, you know, quite frankly, think you're just BSing half the time, but, you know, that's neither here nor there, right? Um, it's somewhere in between. But, um, but, the, but the problem comes in after a while, right? Once you've been in kind of embedded in the business, you start, you know, you start thinking, you know, how can this actually be done, what we're doing be done better? What is the business missing? Because you're kind of in the technical details, but you're also kind of analytically applying those same skills to the business problem you're solving. You're not just taking like, hey, here are the requirements, go build this. At first you are, but you know, once you start developing a sense of the business, um, you find that there's like a little bit of a conflict there that you want to actually make more of a difference with your technology background in the decisions that are being made strategically by the business. Um, so that's the kind of point I found myself in um, at the CME group. And I think that was largely because, and, and fortunately, right, it was working with you actually, um, in our London office, we were kind of like the boiled, condensed down version of the headquarters. So where Chicago had maybe 2,000 people, we had 200 in London. So you got to see the kind of inner workings of the company at a consolidated level. And I think that really changed my thinking in a lot of ways. Um, and then, of course, I met you and you were like, you know, come over to my blockchain world. And we really need some people with, you know, post-trade expertise that think outside of the box. But I think, you know, I mean, ultimately, it fit my personality. I'm left-handed. I'm a little bit more creative. Um, you know, my ambitions go beyond just technology, even though I do miss doing development delivery. But, you know, I think um, ultimately it's that kind of like the mixing of the two skill sets that fit really well. So, you know, it's like a blockchain is a, is a workflow problem. It's a, it's a problem that um, brings, let's say, different people along like the life cycle of a different type of problem. So like for securities markets, right, it's not just like the financial market infrastructure. It's all the market participants, the people raising capital, all the stuff that people think are quote unquote boring and post-trade. Right, you're kind of solving, and you're thinking through those problems um, with a diverse set of participants. So we're gonna talk about that in detail, but before we jump in, just for the benefit of the audience who may not be as familiar with the group's many business lines, can you just give a very brief 
um, overview of the major businesses that the London Stock Exchange group actually houses underneath the umbrella of LSEG because I think people know the stock exchange but they think that's it and that's not true. Yeah, so this is this is a common I mean this is a common, you know, issue with financial market infrastructure. It's the most it's the weirdest business, right? People don't really understand it's the business that people kind of understand but don't. So the London Stock Exchange group and group is the is the keyword is is a lot more than the London Stock Exchange, right? So um, it was formed right in 2007 by the merger of Borsa Italiana, so that's the uh, the Italian stock exchange essentially, and its and its uh, central securities depository, and the London Stock Exchange Group. So that combined together, then um, they added FTSE Russell. Um, we had a technology we acquired a technology company similar to kind of a Nasdaq model. It's called Millennium Technology. So they build like uh, you know matching engines, market surveillance tools, clearing in a box, uh, central securities depository in a box. Um, and then we have the uh, post-trade business, right? So that's LCH. It's not called the London Clearinghouse, even though originally it stood for that. So that's um, that's located in London, in Paris, right? New York. And that's basically a risk management uh, entity primarily. It does equity clearing. It does um, uh, interest rate swaps, that sort of thing. So um, we've got a really broad, diverse set of businesses across financial market infrastructure. It spans more than one asset class. We, uh, we sell tech. We run markets, we run the kind of like the settlement infrastructure, the risk management and data, right? So very different set of market participants all across these different life cycles. And then of course, you know, in the news is the Refinitiv merger that's still happening. So I can't really go into detail, but you know, it, it's, it's along the same lines. Yeah, and, and that's the key is that you operate many different business lines and frankly touch many aspects of the trading life cycle. So with that, um, let's talk a little bit about um, what some of the priorities are from a London Stock Exchange group with respect to uh, digital assets, with respect to blockchain DLT. And we may need to actually divide to a couple of different buckets, right? Because there's all the post-trade related um, discussions and projects, plus the actual issuance side of the business. Um, so can you walk us through maybe the post-trade to start? Because as Boring as post-trade settlement sounds, yeah. actually, and you know, we've talked a lot about this, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit and opportunities for improving the workflow, as you say. Yeah, well, I, I would say, so just to kind of back up, just a quick thing on, on starting with the post-trade piece. Um, actually, the, the way we look at an interesting part of the group where you've got, the, we've got the capital market, which is the London Stock Exchange, and it actually, it's not vertically integrated per se, right? So it's not all combined under one roof, like a derivatives exchange often is where you've got like the trading and the clearing all together right. you need it. Um, so what you have is you have an, a value chain of capital markets, let's say. So right, like the, the, the life cycle of equities, right, or, uh, you know, stock, right? Um, and that has a, an aspect of issuance, uh, listing, trading, settlement post-trade, right? And then there's all that collateral stuff on the back end. All of this is one continuous workflow and it's one continuous problem, right? That's kind of solved by or addressed with blockchain. So on the post-trade side, if we're, if we're focusing really on, on this, we, we can look at it through the prism of post-trade, but always in the, in the respect of that end-to-end -end workflow. Um, so post-trade is really about, and, and if you think about what, what's really going on in a macro trend level, what's happening here is that bl blockchain is really good at tackling like these, these workflow problems. Now, it's, not, it's, it's also good at distracting people um, into thinking that they can lead the charge on a specific blockchain use case. So it's, it's, it's really difficult. And, financial market infrastructure to decide like, well, who's going to like, do the banks do it? Do fintechs do it? Are they going to get disrupted? Who, who, who's the one that's kind of leading some of, some of the, the charge here? On the post-trade side, right, we're looking at like the, the issues that we run into are really ones of that market participants, so the, the people using like risk management services, either directly or indirectly. And most people are using them indirectly, right? Uh, meaning like I execute a trade and it goes through a broker and someone's got a, a you know, like a, a clearing member account over here and I never think about it. Um, but, but the problem is, is that it takes me like three days to get my, you know, stock delivered to my account or my cash delivered from that sale, right? Two or three days through that model. A lot of the, a lot of the post-trade workflow cases on collateral, for example, even at the institutional or individual at the retail level are really ones where, because the workflow is disjointed, right? Because, you know, we hear this over and over reconciliation, but what does it really mean? It, it just means that you've got a system of record in the center, so at the central securities depository, let's say, right? And that is like the final view of like who has what uh, securities, so bonds, equities. 
And right, you've got a series of systems synchronizing with each other at the end of a day, and it's really dull. Uh, but but the ultimate knock-on impact to this is is that it takes days to um, manage and move right assets around legally, and this this impacts like balance sheets of banks. This affects people's ability to get cash, to post margin, right? To, to, to the portability of like being able to move your assets from point A to point B, right? Yeah. We can do it a lot more simply in banking, but why can't we do the same for securities? So all the post-trade use cases around blockchain are really about delivering the di digital asset infrastructure integration with, um, with CSD in order to be able to allow the either the, the, the institutional market participants or their clients, right, to instruct in the movement of collateral and things like cash on a same day basis such that, you know, they can gain from these, these efficiencies, right? So this is, it's just really about um, capital efficiencies at the end of the day, right? And just basically delivering an API to the end client so that they can do what they want to do. It's all about APIs, really. All the stuff, like whether it be in the capital market side or post-trade, ultimately it's like, solution provider builds a solution for a bank or market participant and they need to plug into something in today's world they're just plugging into this swift messaging right and it takes it has to move through these reconciliations it takes days um so there's no reason why we can't we can't fix that right and blockchain is a perfect tool for workflow problems like that as boring as they are right <laughs> but but the, well, the, yeah they cost money they cost time and they cost a lot of frictions in terms of the amount of trouble a, a wrong out trade or a wrong record can cause. And we've seen that. Yeah, yeah we just the, the problem is that we're just we're, we've like we've gotten really good with data. Like so, mm -hmm. APIs and data we can understand. The problem is is when you have a operator like a market operator like a central bank or a central securities depository. Right? These are the guy like the central securities depository is like the central bank of securities. When you have that central operator that has like the really final like record of something, um, you can't get rid of you can't get rid of it um, because you need stability, right? You need stability, you need resiliency, right? So it's kind of like unless you can really provide that same level of resiliency and stability, you're not going to get rid of that that role. So you know, effectively, we're just extending, right? Increasing the access to that programmatically through APIs and blockchain is the facilitator underlying, right? Providing that workflow. Great. And when we think about um, LSEG's digital asset um, crypto strategy, what are you guys thinking about right now? What can you talk about in terms of just where you're looking at either making um, investments, research, um, you know, things that you've announced publicly? So um, as far as cryptocurrency goes? Or digital assets. Yeah, well, so um, digital assets. So we'll just we'll touch on um, digital assets more, and then I can. Well, so I'll, I'll then I'll talk a little bit about like crypto and where that where that is. So we'll separate those two out broadly, right? Because again, and and this is my view of the world, right? And I think the simplified view of the world, then for anybody that's like, well, so crypto. I guess crypto asset is the is the catch all term these days, right? Um, it's funny, um, but you know there there's two categories of crypto assets, right? Cryptocurrencies, which have no centralized authority, so like Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever. And then you have some type of legal structure asset backed token, which means that there may or may not be. So stable coins, central bank digital currency, security tokens, STOs. I mean, it, it, it's some type of some type of legal structure, right? Aspirational legal structure or not. Um, so focusing in on the on the legal structure side of things. So I mean our focus really on digital assets is look you know, we've been doing this for many years, right? So we've seen a lot of attempts, you know, so, so fintech companies trying to build issuance and trading platforms. Um, you know, we've seen these kind of um, what I would call uh, token islands, right? So li literally and, uh, and figuratively, right? So token islands meaning, right, um, that you've got the kind of self-contained platform that's trying to tackle all, the, all these, you know, inefficiencies and in capital raising and build a capital market around it. Um, but the problem is, is that, you know, ultimately, you know, what we have to remember, and so when I go into the strategy, I have to explain one kind of background point, right? Remember that, you know, ownership in an asset, right? Like blockchain is a distraction from the, what we're actually talking about here, right? So just remember this, right? That, that ultimately any asset, like, so a blockchain is a system of record, right? That you would be using. Ultimately though, every asset, right, is backed by a legal structure. So, you know, it, what rights does it confer upon me, the holder of this asset, right? Like, 
So if, if, if there is a ambiguous custody structure for a stable coin and someone runs off with all the money, well, that's a risk, right? So that can't scale, right? So it can scale in a small, you know, like, so in small instances, it scales like a billion dollars. That doesn't, that's not small, but it's small. But, you know, the more and the larger and larger something goes up in size, right? We have, you know, we have kind of industrial scale problems to handle. And, and these become kind of sovereign nation economic problems. So in other words, you know, you, the reason why you can't just go and scale any old stable coin with any old structure is because imagine if, you know, there's a run on the underlying assets or they're missing, you know, all of a sudden the, the regulator of whatever nation that said, oh, that's okay to do is now it's got people knocking down the door, right? Saying like, what happened to my money? Why did you let this happen? Yeah. Same thing. So our focus is on um, answering all those questions and doing what we do now, but, but really focusing it. So what I mean by that is I talked about the workflow thing. So essentially, we're a financial market infrastructure company. We, we face off to a variety of um, market participants, like from, from issuance, right? And like helping like small to medium enterprise set up a corporate structure to be able to raise capital, all the way to like the boring post trade stuff, right? Where we're managing risk and margin and it's very back office-y and it's disconnected from the other side. Um, our digital asset strategy is focused on linking up and looking at this as the value chain of capital markets. So in other words, not looking at post trade stuff at least on capital markets, but rather saying, okay, we've got like a fundamental workflow problem here. We are a financial market infrastructure company that faces off to all these participants. Why aren't we going across the, I hate saying silos, the different parts of the organization to build this foundational layer infrastructure because ultimately like all of the different fintech companies that are looking to let's say solve a problem in the real estate market or solve a pro or um, offer a solution for uh, capital raising um, for small to medium businesses that they, they're focused in on all want that commoditized like settle legal settlement infrastructure and and the problem the reason why it doesn't exist is because it's so disconnected, right? It's, it's not, there's no single workflow. So they want an API to say, I can issue a legal security, okay? I can transfer a legal security from point A to point B. So they want that commoditized, industrialized, foundational layer infrastructure. So our right. strategy is really focused on serving those kind of guys, right? Serving, opening up the world to trusted platforms and participants that can more directly access those services. And that's what people want. Open banking in Europe has done the same thing, but it's, ca it's it's about cash. Cash is simpler. Commercial bank money is different than securities, right? The yep, yep. And when you think about um, all the fintechs that are out there trying to solve for this, and you alluded to, um, you know, creating token islands, um, is there a world where we cross over where an incumbent like yourself could work with um, some of these, you know, more trustworthy and credible? Um, startups to start connecting the dots because right now it's quite a fragmented space. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Oh yeah, no, so absolutely. So, you know, we made an investment in, in uh, FinTech called Navara. This is just one example, but um, it's not that we, you know, we, we- Can you explain what Navara is just for those who are not familiar? Yeah, so we have, a, so our strategy, is, so I talked about the kind of the end-to-end -end value chain and um, how right. we view digital assets and what needs to be enabled. Um, so one of our investments along that line was, you know, we recognize that we can't build everything and we don't have the answer to everything. Big, you know, a large enterprise. We have a focus. We're good at making markets, building industrial risk management solutions. Like we're good at certain things and we're not good at others. That's okay. Um, Navura was a London fintech or is a London uh, fintech startup that was focused on the issue in space for debt and equity. Um, they were focused on the, they realized the, that, um, you know, every one of these dealings has a legal structure underlying it, which we all know, but they really wanted to focus on the automation of the legal side of things. So like, how do we make a contract, a legal contract that we can create to make like, say a bond, right? And essentially commoditize that and perform an issuance and then streamline that or, you know, allow that to automatically flow into, let's say a central securities depository, right? And then allow that to be a listed instrument potentially. Um, so they focused on that exact space, the kind of front end issuance workflow space. Now, um, we saw that as kind of a nice complement to what we were looking to do with our issuer services business and elite business. So elite is uh, another one of these um, businesses we have that help small to medium enterprise raise capital. But we didn't have a lot of solutions there. 
So like Navura is just an example of, you know, a, uh, a platform, right? A FinTech company, a platform that's, that's kind of serving a specific need. But again, they need to plug into some type of infrastructure to, to actually achieve the full benefits of this. Now, our model, right? We're open access already. And open access just means that, you know, you can decide, you know, you don't have to use our clearinghouse, right? You can go to any 23 post trade destinations around the world. You know, we provide the liquidity pool for buyers and sellers, right, to match, right? And then it goes and settles somewhere else. Um, now on the on the front end side of things with issuance, we have our own solutions, but really like we, we get our volume from the market from others. So the, the whole idea here is that we collaborate with FinTech, but we're just giving them the foundational pipe that they need to be able to build their solutions that actually scale into, into like the settlement infrastructure. Right. Because otherwise you're gonna end up with a token island. And, and that's the key thing. I think um, anyone who uh, has been in the space for a while understands that blockchain is, many people refer to it as a team sport. And uh, you build it and they will come is really a bad way to approach um, blockchain solutions. Um, but, uh, you know, building on what you said, when you think about um, stable coins that have recently come into play and mm. the rise of the conversation around CBDC. None of these things are new, but yet they seem to be in vogue now um, and accelerated partially due to the Libra announcement last year. And when we think about um, central banks digitizing their, their fiat currency, uh, there are some, you know, I guess compelling um, reasons to do that. But in your view, will London Stock Exchange Group um, play a role in at least the stablecoin side, or are you just watching and monitoring and um, you know seeing how it evolves? So uh, this is interesting. Um, so stablecoins. Um, so we're a little bit less involved, but here, here's 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 where it actually kind of like it all kind of runs together. Okay, so like if you look at you know the elephant in the room, Libra. Um, but just any stable coin, right? It's not even a specific call out of Libra. Libra is interesting because you've got the network effect, which everyone wants a network effect these days, right? Like there's so many business models built on network effects, but you know, it's, it's, it's the hardest part to get. So you've got 2 billion users, right? And then all of a sudden they're going to um, enter an industry they never entered before, like finance, right? So all of a sudden you've got scale, right? So it's not like $1 billion worth of a stable coin. You're talking 2 billion people, that would be 50 cents a person, right? So obviously it's something much larger. So um, the, the, the problems that are repetitive with things like stable coins, and this is where it overlaps with what we're doing, but I'll, I'll, I'll just explain it, is it's just a, a stable coin is nothing more than a, like again, it's a legal, there's a legal structure, like someone's holding, like some legal entity is holding a bunch of assets, right? And it's it's stabilized or priced in a certain way. Now there's the purest stable coins in cryptocurrency. They can remain over here. I'm talking about the asset backed ones, the ones, the legal asset backing, right? Like with, whether that be a currency or it's holding some kind of bonds, who knows? But these are again, like securities, right? And, and essentially, Right, the same problems that you see with like electronically traded funds where, um, you know, like an electronically traded fund, right, an ETF, a lot of people buy these things these days, right, they have an entire like um, regulation set that are designed around like redemption so that like if I want to go get the assets or we need to redeem and sell the underlying portfolio, it's got to be there, it's got to be held in a specific legal structure, right, because you need the assurance that the assets are actually there, right, and, you know, it, it needs to be robust to handle um, a mass sell-off as an example. So the, those same scalable industrial problems exist for stable coins actually. So to me, actually something like a Libra or any other stable coin, really what they want is they wanna build a solution for their clients um, it, that is nothing more than a, it is a security, it's a legal structure that's holding assets. I mean, that's all it is. So to me, actually it's the same problem again. So we're not specifically focused on it, but I find it as an, an, a, an interesting applicable use case to what we're building, right? That would serve that market. Again, we're just the infrastructure provider. We're not there to try to take over the world here. We're just trying to enable what's already happening, but in a scalable way, like, and not in a regulated, slow moving, you know, kind of um, slowing innovation. No, 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 it's not, it's not that, right? Like we're focused on the, the core, our core kind of pillars, like reliability, scalability, consumer and economic protection, right? Like that's what we want.
Yes, something I think you you touch on is, you know, market infrastructure, when the pipes are working, nobody ever says anything. You don't get yeah. a pat in the back, but when it breaks, man, do you hear about it, right? Absolutely, yeah, of course. So um, steady as you go, that I completely understand, that's gotta work and to scale. Um, let's talk, and, and for those, by the way, who are listening, thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, please put questions in the Q&A box. I am going to go to questions in about four minutes, but for right now, I'm going to ask one more to Michael because you've mentioned a lot about legal construct and really you're touching upon risk management and, um, you know, frameworks that allow us to operate and understand what to do, whether it's digital assets or whether it's traditional securities. We need the sort of, you know, um, rules of the game. And if we don't have that, it's quite hard to navigate and, as you say, scale and risk manage and have the financial stability to be able to deal with, as we are well aware, financial crises and or, um, you know, shocks to the market. So when we take that um, frame of mind, what is London Stock Exchange approach around governance and controls when you're looking at this new generation of market infrastructure as it's evolving? Um, do you think the governance and control um, issues are the same or are they slightly different because we're now dealing with um, a digital asset world or data as value? Yeah, so this is such a, you know, so the, the funny part about it is where, we, where we've gone with blockchain is, is like actually we've gone and it's probably just indicates where we are in the maturity curve of things. Um, we're, we're now like, I mean, honestly, uh, we're now down to the deep uh, philosophical um, level of things. Um, and this is how I'm going to answer your question. Um, so, like, the, typically, like, you know, people's eyes roll back when they hear about, like, governance and, like, you know, like, these princi like principles. And, you know, they're like, oh, God, boring. Like, you know, it's just it's old, old speak. But here. So here's what's, here's what's happening, right, with governance, right? So, look, the bottom line is this. Um, what's – so let's acknowledge a, a, a few fundamentals, right? So like, you know, generally, right, economies, you know, go governments remain, I mean, like we can debate this a little bit, but like governments are in power be generally and like dem and democratically elected like countries, right? Because they provide stable, stable economies, they provide um, essentially, you know, law and order, right? Just things that are predictable. And this, the same goes for economy, right? Economy is absolutely fundamental. Um, so, you know, when we look at financial, the, the financial, markets right or we look at like financial systems like central banks banking right stocks bonds these sorts of things right essentially the the systems that, that are put in place right need to be robust and function right like you don't want the central banks you know systems not working you don't want the um you don't want um your securities or cash uh, securities portfolio to just disappear right because something went wrong with the operator right you and you also want like a, a clear legal structure and someone to go to when something does go wrong Okay, so given that, right, that fundamental of just how, how things work. Um, so here's what we see is what blockchain does. So I think it does something really interesting. Previously, and why we haven't seen a lot of innovation in like, we saw innovation in banking. Again, I go back to open banking where you, know, you have the commercial bank and central bank model. Um, cash is a little bit simpler to represent in technology systems than let's say securities. And banks actually have a lot more leeway with creating cash supply, like commercial bank money. Right. Then, you know, like, let's say a, a custodian can just like create equity. It's no, and I can't do that. So there's a lot more like leeway there to essentially provide, um, provide more uh, innovation at the endpoints for, um, you know, for fintechs, right. To come in and build things like Revolut and Monzo and all these different platforms. I don't know what they have in the US, Venmo, right. uh, Pay PayPal. Um, now governance though so here's the here's the thing so blockchain the cool part about blockchain though is that it allows for any any like centralized entity like a central security suppository a central bank a bank anybody anything right to put in place the governance rules of a system but then essentially go hands off when it comes to transacting which means that you know you can have the same assurances of let's say bilateral actors, right? Like finally being able to access these systems rather than like intermediated, right? And then all centralized and controlled. Um, while at the same time, allowing for that entity to still supervise and like put the rules in place. So centralized governance, decentralized transacting. That's actually the really powerful piece. So it's finally allowing us to 
centralize the governance, but then the technology implementation can actually kind of move out to the periphery. Before it was that the only way to centralize the governance and technology was to put everything together in one place. That is the power, right? And then that's why we can start doing these workflow problems. And that's how we can still have that kind of centralized role while at the same time kind of like uh, unbundling, right? Unbundling essentially uh, the services provided by these centralized entities. This increases competition, increases access, you know, lowers fees, right? It's, it's, it's all good. Well, it's good for those who actually are able to adapt. I don't know about those who are going to be left behind in um, the new world. But there's an interesting question here. I'm going to I'm going to ask a question now, Mike. Um, mm -hmm. Elizabeth has asked whether your members, your clients, your customers have expressed a desire to ledgerize or to use, um, you know, a blockchain-based system or a DLT-based system, uh, or are they opposed to second-generation infrastructure? Or do they even know? Do they even care? Have you gotten any feedback? <laughs> so um, th the answer is no, people aren't. Um, so it depends where you're talking, but um, there's definitely interest across the board in um, so we're beyond, so remember, yeah, and Sandra and I were in the, in the same boat here. You know, there were the early days of blockchain use cases and half of the problem was figuring out like, were you in the position to lead a, a use case? So like if we were looking at like cash settlement, let's say of like two currency pairs, well, maybe the, the, the CCP or the clearinghouse, right? Was not in the position to lead that. It's actually more of a banking problem, right? but, but wait, wait. Um, so now we know like what we're good at and what we can control and what and what we can lead. Um, and given that, and given that kind of we've kind of like, you know, all the kind of smoke has cleared the air. And I think people are thinking clearly now about things patiently. They're not gonna be disintermediated, et cetera, but it's no panic. Um, yes, we have absolutely had interest um, from different market participants from, and this, this goes for our capital markets uh, use cases, right? Down to anything we're doing with, with, with crypto related uh, use cases um, and definitely post trade, of course. So um, market participants actually are like, thank God the market infrastructure providers coming and trying to organize something. Now, I think the hard part is, you know, forming like the, um, the stage two where you're actually executing it. Um, you know, the stage, the stage two kind of steering group. Um, I think that's the next kind of uh, piece that, you know, you'll see more and more of, but, but absolutely, we 100%. I think, I think they're happy to see market infrastructure lead where they should. Um, yeah, so we've, We've had decent reception. So as a follow on to that question, um, you know, in, in previous uh, financial services world, and even a bit today, it was rare to find banks working together, uh, at least intimately on, on infrastructure level projects uh, where they have to share or something. Everyone built their own. Same thing with market infrastructure. Market infrastructure yeah. tended to build their own stuff. Um, yeah. What are you seeing now? Has there been a change in the last five, ten years? Uh, shift towards more collaboration, consortia? Or are we still seeing the "it's mine, hands off" attitude? I think between market infrastructure providers, there's definitely uh, competition. It's still a competitive environment. Mm -hmm. um, so, but but among the market participants, so I, uh, the market participants that we deal with, you know, banks, right, uh, getting together around the problem. Uh, let's say um, brokers or, or um, uh, um, what we call nomads, nominated advisory firms that are helping companies raise capital, getting or getting together on the problem. Um, you know, uh, bond dealers, right? They're they're all. Um, it seems like you're getting a lot of these kind of consortium around like buy side problems, sell side problems, custodians problems, that sort of thing. Um, especially where, and, and this has already been happening, right? Like where they've got kind of like a like a back office cost, right? And they're trying to offload as much cost as possible. They will collaborate and they have been. And, you know, some of them see it as like an efficiency gain. Some of them see it as like additional channels, right? For sales, um, you know, so there, there's, I think it's not comp like what we're dealing with is not necessarily competitive. Um, it's more, it's more about like essentially working together to eliminate you know, a, a big problem. And then they see themselves as differentiating competing in different ways. So, you know, I think these commoditized things like performing settlement and back office stuff, it was always considered kind of a commodity anyway, kind of a necessary evil, not a like differentiator, like, oh, we're so good at back office, come, you know. Um, right, So right. They, they compete on other sides of the business. 
So I think actually, and, and that's the thing about blockchain, right? It, it does tackle all of those kind of those problems, but it does tap, but you know, what you'll see the competition, right? Is that because you start opening up, um, let's say, uh, you, you create more competition through any, any form of access to any of your services. Therefore, it does start to open up competition between established incumbents and new entrants, right? And they have to differentiate in what they're actually good at. This is, I mean, just, you see the same model in real estate, right? Where you see like the traditional real estate agents versus, was it Redfin or something I've heard in the US? You know, where you've got, um, but, but the, the thing is fundamentally, right? they will succeed where they are, where they have a core skill. And then some of their excess costs will, will dissipate, but it's not that, you know, one is going to be, it's not a simple binary story of one wipes out and one remains, right? It's, it's a little bit more nuanced. And I think the specialization and focus of these businesses um, will increase, right? So like, you know, where you're really good, that's where you're going to be really good and you're going to differentiate. Um, and all this kind of superfluous extra fees, Right, the kind of the the kind of bloat, right? The kind of forms around businesses that starts disappearing a bit more, right? That's really what it's about. Thanks for that. And I'm going to go to a question that Tom, our fellow market infrastructure friend, has asked regarding ASX. Um, their project, they needed to re first of all, they needed to replace Chess. That was something mm -hmm. that was just you know they publicly stated needed to be replaced, which is their back end settlement and payment system. So that was a given, but back in 2014, 15, I guess when they were making the decision, they decided to opt for a DLT solution. So Tom's question is ASX, Australia Stock Exchange's settlement pro project is going back a year. What's your view on that? I mean, part of the delays are probably related to um, what's going on with the pandemic, but have you been following um, what's going on with uh, ASX? And do you feel like market infrastructure's got eyes on this? Because it is the first major replacement of a backend system. Um, so the answer is yes, market infrastructure has eyes on it, of course. Uh, because I mean, I'll, I'll say it, God knows how many times I've gotten that email from who knows, you know, anyone in the business, right? Have you seen this headline, right? <laughs> yeah. So we, of course we watch, and, and you know everyone does it, right? Um, and the first thing I would say to ASX is uh, hats off always, like tons of respect for big, bold initiatives, first movers, because man, you know, and I know it firsthand, but like, uh, you know, it's hard, uh, things will go wrong. You're the first mover, like um, lots of credit, right? Like honestly, credit where credit is due. Um, but there's also the, pro the problem with first mover is that, you know, sometimes you make because you're, you know, making decisions for the first time, right? Like all the, you know, hindsight's 2020, um, and you're going to have a lot more of that in, the, in this space. So I think it's no surprise that they've, you know, had some, let's say, issues with, you know, the complexity of the build or some elements of their approach may have initially needed to be changed because they, they, they you know, maybe they proved not quite the, uh, they were a little bit too utopian maybe, but that's normal, right? Um, so I wouldn't criticize it at all and say it's to be expected. Um, and that's where the second the second mover or third mover advantage comes in line. Um, but anyway, so um, what do I, so what do I think of it? Um, the only thing I would say is that um, I my approach to or our approach right to DLT is and this is this is a kind of a nuance here. Like in the early days when they were kind of focused on all of us when we were focused on DLT, it was kind of like we wanted to replace all the existing systems and put all of this. So this is not like Bitcoin, you know, or, or really simplistic crypto type use cases, but rather like rebuild all the systems and workflow across all the participants. Oh my God, that's complicated, right? Yeah. Like you are you are fighting, and I worked in technology development, right? In, in, at, C, at the CME group, like 10 years, right? I mean, you know, you know, we're risk adverse, like, you know, uh, and the systems are complicated. Like you, you can't ask everyone in a workflow to rebuild their IT stack from the ground up. So I think maybe, right, there, there was a, a more balanced approach that could have been taken, but in hindsight, like how, how could you know that? Um, so I think it's no surprise to me that it's an extra year. I think it's perfectly reasonable. I mean, who else has delivered something, right? So actually they're arguably, they're early, they're not late, unless everyone else is delivering around them and they're still behind. That's the way I would look at it. I, too. Think, I think that's a great way to look at it. Um, and, and I do agree. Hats off to anyone who's trying to pioneer uh, in a space where entrenched, entrenched um, thinking, mindset, culture is very difficult to navigate, um, let alone the technology implementation. All right. We got a couple more questions here. Mike, if you don't mind, we're going to no. ask you a few more. 
Um, we've got one from Alex. I think it was a very interesting one around um, most securitized blockchain market infrastructure is becoming private DLT based. Um, looking at, for example, Vanguard and Symbian. Um, does the London Stock Exchange Group see value in a public um, and hybrid, I guess, public private blockchain stack um, like Algorand's or others um, similar? Mm -hmm. So it's yeah, a so, question around public versus private, right? Well, so I, I think, look, the bottom line is this. So remember, it's always about principles, right? So, no, no, and what I mean by that is, um, does, okay, I don't care, uh, honestly. And, and this is how, how we should look at it, right? Like, and um, I don't care if it's public or private, right? It's more about does it meet my requirements, right? So like, yeah. you know, do, do, am I able to attain the same level, exact same level of resiliency? Can I provide for the exact same level of like governance and control, disaster recovery, right? Like data privacy where I need it, right? If I can do all that, then f fair play, um, right? And can I get the type of transaction volume, right? that I'm looking for, then fine. Like I honestly, no opinion, right? Because it's always the, it's the, we're just ticking the, the tick boxes of principle. So it's more about like, you know, how do I handle outsourcing? Like, again, it's all theoretical, right? So like a central securities depository or even central bank, right? Like it's not the walls of the building that makes it the central bank, right? Like, so the systems that they use, right? Aren't contained in those walls, right? It's a, it's a, the system that, you know, let's say um, a central bank or central securities depository uses. Um, is just a, it's just a fact of like control and outsourcing, right? So it's like, you know, are you, do you have the control over this? Are you able to recover from this, right? Like, you know, do you have all of these things in place? Um, I wouldn't care where it is or how it exists so long as you, you know, check the check boxes. So my answer is if it checks the check boxes, fine. Has it, but to be more specific and rather less abstract, um, have I seen that? the check box is checked for like a public, like a purest public piece of infrastructure that meets our requirements? No. Um, but if it did, we'd look at it. It's the answer. Yeah. Right? So it's just governance and control, resiliency, disaster recoverability, privacy, right? So let's build on that because I recently had a conversation with a major bank, uh, global bank about this problem. Um, it was proposed that if there was a, um, performance index or some sort of performance set of benchmarks that you could compare blockchains to. And one of the biggest issues right now, no matter how big or good a technical group is inside of a bank or market infrastructure, it's actually quite difficult to evaluate um, blockchains and their performance um, capabilities on a apples to apples basis. Um, in other technology sets, there are already standards like that, performance benchmark standards. Um, do you think that would be helpful to, if that was created for blockchain so that big enterprises and corporates, small enterprises could actually, you know, kind of say, hey, okay, here, someone's approached me about a blockchain. I'm going to compare it to these metrics. We've tried that actually internally. Um, and? and usually, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I don't, maybe, maybe, but like, okay, so let's just be blunt I'm, because like this is, I might as well just be really blunt about it. Um, look, um, th there's like, so if you're looking at an enterprise use case, like, or again, it's not an enterprise, sorry, it, I shouldn't say enterprise use case, a, a use case where you need to build something like a piece of settlement infrastructure, right? Which is really kind of sounds boring, but like that's versus like, let's say a, um, I'll give you another example where it's a little bit, you have a different set of requirements. Let's say you're building a more like a, um, su like supply chain, right? Use case, right? Blockchain is supply chain management, right? Where you're like looking at the origin of a good. The supply chain one is very different, like in its requirements around resiliency and privacy, right? right? And recoverability versus like a piece of settlement infrastructure. So piece of settlement infrastructure has got all this, right? Like it, it's, it's a fundamental part of the economy, essentially. So there's a lot of um, need for resiliency and protection. So um, I, I think with, as far as like performance goes, right? And given the fact of like these, this set of requirements, there's only, only a small subset of blockchains, right? That are gonna have a large developer community. And you know who, which blockchains you are. A large open, open source developer community, right? That I can easily, you know, get like tons of developers and 
big, um, let's say, uh, technology consultancies to supply, supply me with help, right? So there's only a limited number. So sure, you could build something for these enterprise use cases. If, the, if that number grows on the enterprise side, fair play. Um, then you've got the use cases where I don't have the same, um, let's say, resiliency, transaction, scalability requirements, which then opens up to a lot more, right, newer approaches to solving these problems. So I'm thinking of like some of the new emerging, um, you know, fu uh, foundational layer uh, DLT uh, projects that are kind of right coming about. Right. Those ones. I, I think it would be helpful for those, but the enterprise ones, it's already kind of there. I mean, I don't, I don't know if it'll really sell me on, on using these these smaller guys for the kind of the bigger industrial problem. Okay. If that makes sense. All right. No, very valid um, point. Um, so we've got a question here from Keith around um, BIS Zurich Innovation Hub is working with the Swiss National Bank and Six Group on DLT settlement with CBDC. Um, BIS has now announced a set of new innovation hubs, one in London in particular, um, presumably it will be with BOE. Um, do you see a world where um, LSEG would be collaborating uh, in that respect, uh, similarly as um, there's a central bank, Swiss central bank and uh, six um, collaboration? Yeah, I mean, 100%, of course we would. Um, and we do. So for example, right, so, um, you know, natural, like, so we already, so we, we participate, um, and I should mention our, our head of capital markets, uh, right, he's, he was ex-treasury, or not head of capital markets, London Stock Exchange business, right? He, was, he came from, the, I believe, the UK Treasury, right? And he joined London Stock Exchange. He was with us for a number of years, and now he's gone off to head the uh, Financial Conduct Authority in the in, in the UK. But um, of course, like being the the UK's largest capital market, where um, where we intimately, very closely work with the regulators. Um, what you know, uh, and, and on on all levels, right? So the the fund the fund level that's always more um, you know, uh, let's say more casual is obviously on the innovation side of things, right? And the enforcement is a totally different, right? More strict regime that uh, we work with them on. So 100%, of course, of course, we would participate. And CBDC, we're, you know, absolutely, you know, focused in on it, like the post-trade side is focused in, um, even the capital market side, right? Because when we're looking at our overall settlement model, I mean, th these are all part of that workflow. So um, yeah, I look. Like, I encourage the you know the Bank of International Settlement and these kind of international where you're kind of bringing together the um, these kind of hubs, right, and uh, for cross collaboration standards. We need it, right? The EU the, the EU is only one part of the of the puzzle. We need the you know the G7 G20 work just as much. Yeah, yeah. good to hear. Um, we've got a question here from Raj, um, or maybe it's Roger. Um, how do you deal with the complexity of interoperability and onward sales monitoring from a KYC? Ah, this is the KYC question, actually. KYC AML perspective, and how can this be inbuilt? Um, I guess the question is, you know, your versus your current KYC and AML systems, is there a role for blockchain and or DLT to play to um, yeah. enhance? Yeah, I, I got it. Systems? Well, here, here's what it so here, here's here's the way we look at this, and the, so remember, like again, uh, like most of the ways we've been looking at applying blockchain, it's like it's really about so it's it's not about blockchain, it's about addressing so fundamentally, right? Like it's it's addressing the desire for um, the end actors, right, or the end participants in some kind of workflow value chain. So like again, like someone that's actually issuing a security, someone that's holding a security. Right or or any of these actors, right? Um, it, it's about them being able to directly, uh, right, transact, right, and and control their assets, right, or interact with the API in some way. Uh, however, right, so that's more of moving from a B to B to B to C kind of model or enabling that, right? Like, and this is this is pretty broad. So th this is where this AML KYC question comes into me, right? Like, so the question of like distribution like distribution and who and who like you know if we plan to go farther out along that are we going to then like have to do aml and kyc on, on like the end-to-end -end clients right as an example and the answer to me is uh, the answer i would give is, is no so so what we would do is and, and the way to think about how we'd approach this is currently of course we have aml kyc um that exists for our direct um participants right so brokers, custodians, these types of people. 
Right. Now their clients, they handle and they are responsible fully for their clients. So that the model, and, I, and we've seen this hierarchical model quite a bit, is you have the tools, right, to provide your clients with direct access, but you also maintain that responsibility as you do today down to the end client. So it's just essentially a model of hierarchy where you push that responsibility down to, let's say, the like who you know we as a business interact with. So I would say we don't want to build solutions that go all the way to the end user. We want the, we want those um, those kind of touch points to serve to to perform that AML KYC piece, right? So like a fintech firm would be a better app to be able to do that, so long as they pass you know our requirements as an example, right? Or like a, just like a a broker or custodian does today. So I mean I think and, and blockchain is great at preserving hierarchies, right? And multi signature, so like multi, through multi sig, right? And so. Um... When you think about things that concern you from a competitive standpoint, I mean, London Stock Exchange Group is a very large organization and you've got multiple business lines. Um, you know, you've got fintech innovators, entrepreneurs who are probably uh, either wanting to collaborate with you or trying to eat your lunch, but the big techs are coming in and you alluded to that. All of a sudden, boom, one of them decides to launch and go into finance and they've got a network effect that is bigger than a single country um, in terms of its distribution path. What do you think about when you think about big tech, for example, going into um, the space and your space? And also, do you worry about any other threats? Maybe it's not big tech. Yeah, so I mean, big tech, of course, um, are, 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 are friends. Um, everyone's friend, right? Um, no, no. So yeah, of course, of course, we so of course I'm, we worry about big tech because um, here's what I would say about big tech though. Um, again, they're they are building um, so so they so they've got network usually right some type of network effect really good at like disruptive business model innovation right like you know they, they you know Amazon's like cranking out new new business models like they're re, they're reinventing their business model all the time um, and then they're they're providing the kind of like the necessary outsourced infrastructure for a lot of like what, you know, banks and financial market infrastructure is building on top of, right? So, and they've got, you know, all of the, and they, and they hoover up, right? This, you know, they've got all of the tech, te excited tech talent. Um, what they don't have again is the, but it doesn't mean they can't have it. Um, they don't have the, like, they don't have the fun foundational understanding of like how to make markets, like how to create like regulated products you know, th these are established relationships like that exist, you know, um, that are kind of held within a specific industry, um, not necessarily something you can just commoditize and crank out. And we've seen this, right? Like even with crypto exchanges where it's like, oh yeah, or just like STOs. Oh yeah, you know, ex exchanges are completely irrelevant. We're just matching buyers and sellers. What could possibly go wrong, right? Like, you know, you don't need all this due, di due diligence. Come on, guys. That's so antiquated. Like, you know, we've got this, you know, we've got this utopia over here where your grandmother's, you know, retirement account's going to go tenfold. Oops, it didn't. Um, so, you know, but it's the same thing, right, um, for, for big tech. So I think we, in certain areas around data, maybe, um, you know, big tech has more attention. When you start getting into um, securities and that, that side of things, probably a little bit less. But I think, I think every FMI um, has, you know, and, and other industries have their eye on big tech, especially when it comes to data use cases, um, right, would be the kind of the, the, the long and short answer. Yeah. Um, no. and, other, and other threats, other threats. And here's the other thing. Um, it, and this is, this goes for all FMIs, and this is my opinion here. Um, so we talk, you know, we see like all these emerging, you know, fintech companies, right, trying to provide different solutions along our value chain or complementary to it. Um, and, you know, I mentioned Token Islands. Now, I'm not discounting their efforts at all, right? Like, there's good stuff being built. Um, and th the truth is, is we, we either have an opportunity or we have a threat. So, like, you can, it's kind of like a gradual building of tension, right? So, like, if we don't deliver, um, you know, solutions that allow these guys to plug in and sufficiently innovate, right, and build and, and create value, right, around all these different problems we have, then we will see a critical mass, like a growing wave come and overtake. Um, so, so I think, you know, really what we're trying to do here is fundamentally understand a role and specialize, build that strong foundational layer, let, it's, I call it open access 2.0, this is me, this is Mike's term, you know, the next generation of open access, 
Um, we, that's what we need to build and spend money on and invest. And it delivers efficiencies to market participants. It delivers innovation. It, there's a lot of good stuff. It's, I like it's that. A really abs- it's a really abstract sell, okay, I know. And people be like, well, why, why are we using blockchain again? I, I just answered that question the other day. Um, I answer it at least twice a week <laughs> uh, for the last 10 years, for the last five years. Um, but but that's really our, that's that's the way we look at it. And and so that's the sell. I, I, I have to sell to our internal stakeholders as well, right? And, and then the FMI, I think. Yeah. No, understood, and um, really appreciate your views on that. And we're going to round out this hour. It's already flown by and um, gotten so many great insights from you, Michael. But we want to ask one final question. I think this is advice that you would give to anyone who's out there who's a fintech entrepreneur trying to pitch to you or other big market infrastructure banks. Um, Please give some, you know, two cents on things maybe to do and maybe things not to do um, that, you know, may trigger pet peeves of yours at this point. Um, Provide some insight, please. Yeah, so um, what not to do. Actually, you know, it's so funny. I almost said, I'll give you a pet peeve real quick though. Um, I call it, uh, this this is another mic term. I think, I think I made this term up. I call it organizational canvassing. So this is where you send the same email to all these different influencers in the organization. And usually things always come back to one point. So I'll end up like a FinTech sending me an email, sending some other senior leader, some other senior leader, some other senior leader. They end up spent like somehow two or three conversations get spun up, but I ultimately end up finding out about it. And that just, you know, it's like, oh my God. I, I'm very um, familiar with that. That is very, I agree with you. It's very annoying. It doesn't help though because ultimately it was going to go through the same channel anyway so um unless you're not i think it's okay to do a little bit like reach out to a few but probably like loop in the other person that you reached out to as well because then i think they'll just appreciate it more because sometimes like yeah like i'll have too much in my inbox and i won't i'll forget to respond i'm guilty right? like it happens um i think the other thing is is um really understand the the like who you're pitching to like really understand like where their business is differentiated and like how you're kind of augmenting what they do. So like really focus, you know, you really have to focus to your problem. And this is so abstract, right? Because I, I would have to critique an individual thing, but like, you know, you you can't just be solving everything, right? Like you need to, it's usually like a focus problem, a focus market, and, and you really need this incumbent for a specific reason. So unless you really kind of understand their business and have focused your problems efficiently, like big enterprise is always hard to approach because they're going to be put off, right, by a lack of understanding that, you know, you're showing or, you know, it's just a not good fit, right? It's more about like, yeah, it's more about something that's like, always try to find something that's complementary. It's like, it's got to be like a complementary approach, right? Like a partnership complementary approach to things. Um, And I think you'll find, you'll find more reception. So, you know, where you can give them a, a, a model, like don't dictate the business model to them like just show the complimentary relationship and the business model will be developed and negotiated later anyway. Yeah. No, understand their problems. And I would also say, um, and, and look to be solving something that they can't solve themselves. Uh, but it's hard to know sometimes. So it's just good to have a real, like, and don't go too deep if you're not, sh- if you're unsure either. Cause then sometimes it, like, yeah. you don't need to, you don't need to, right? Like focus in on what you're really trying to bring value to the organization and like how you're being complimentary. And, and if, if you're not, if you don't feel like you're complimenting, it's probably a bad, it's a bad approach, right? You need to find someone else to approach. Well, Mike, I have to say, I think we could talk for another several hours about the yeah. topic and uh, get into much more detail around tokenization and uh, is, on the issuance side. But unfortunately, we're out of time. I'm going to hand back over to Sophia. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll, have, we'll have to have an update again. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Mike, for joining us. And thank you to everyone uh, who tuned into today's webinar and for your insightful questions. A recording of this webinar will be made available online and shared with you shortly. We hope you will join us for next week's Global Leader episode with Hogan Lovell's technology partner, John Salmon, um, and Global Digital Finance Executive Co-Chair Lawrence Wintermeyer on July 7th at 9 a.m. Eastern Time, which is the same time as today. We will circulate the registration link for that webinar along with the recording of today's session. Thanks so much to everyone and goodbye.